Someone first service said you should wear the parachute pants and you know, get all jewelry and then do like the MC Hammer thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm really more of a kid of the 80s. I never wore, never wore parachute pants. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. That, but I, I hear that and it's nostalgic now. I'm like, man, M M Hammer, where'd you go? I need more Hammer in my life. Okay, so we are in the middle of a series on prayer for us. This is, this is a big deal as a church because we don't want this to be a two-week thing that we concentrate on in the text. You know, we gather around. Prayer for us, we are a praying church. We pray as a staff. We've got prayer cards in, in front of us in the chairs, and that prayer list grows. We, we go through it, and sometimes we see something in a prayer request, like, man, we need to find out what's going on there and get with them. Like, we pray at the beginning of elders' meetings. We, we, we pray on the phone with people. We pray in the lobby with people. We pray down front after services with people. I will pray with you at Publix, right? I mean, I, I, I don't, we, we are a praying church. This is the fabric of who we are as a church. And so it's appropriate that we take a couple of weeks before we launch into this new Transform series to just be like, man, let's make sure that we know that we are connected. I'm telling you, there, there was a guy just last service, if you're online, a uh, guy attended. He got baptized at Honeymoon Island on Thursday. Uh, they didn't want to wait. Uh, one of our safety team members, a friend of his, is like, Let's do it now. I, I, he texts me. He's like, hey, you want to baptize someone? I'm like, well, I'm in Nashville today. He's like, forget it. We don't need a pastor. Let's go to Honeymoon Island. I'm like, we're going we're gonna to go to Honeymoon Island next Sunday night uh, for churchwide beach baptisms next Sunday night. But they're like, we're just, you know, we don't, we'll do it ourselves, right? And they went out there, and they're this is crazy to baptize this guy. And there's some other people from our church and they were fishing. They didn't even know. They just wasn't playing there. And they were on our baptism team. Like, we got a team of people to help us. Back. They're on the, and they're like, oh, my goodness. They're, they're baptizing someone. They must be from our church. I don't know. If they, they go over there, and they are. So they have this little service, right? I'm talking to this guy in the lobby. And he said, I was up all night. I just didn't know what to expect coming to church. He's like, I'm not a, I'm not a churchy guy. And I'm like, well, bro, you know, what was, what, what was your experience? He said, I can't tell you how... Uh, welcomed I felt with people who know Jesus. I felt so welcomed. And so if you're here today and it's your first time, I want to say this, welcome. You can, you can belong here and we will love you before you believe everything that we believe. Our prayer is that you come to believe it. If you're here today because you were drug here or you're here because you want to be here, I would say all of us probably have something we can learn from God's word about prayer. God's Word's got some stuff to say about how we connect to Him. And a lot of people just do not know what God's Word has to say about prayer. Because of it, they kind of hit a wall in connecting to God. I love what Max Lucado, Max Lucado says about prayer. And Max, he says, uh, our prayers sometimes are awkward, right? I mean, you ever, you ever hear one of those, right? I mean, I do that sometimes where I start praying. I'm like, oh, this is a train wreck. I don't know where this is going. You know, pull this out of a nose. God, God doesn't care. Max Cutter kind of says, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers make a difference. Woo! Some of us, I love that. I see, I see these heads all around. I don't know if you're at home nodding right now or not, but around this room, I see a lot of people going, yeah, prayers make a difference. But I know in a room this size, when I, when I say something like that, about the power of prayer, there are those of us who know Jesus and love Jesus, but there are those sometimes like, oh, he didn't answer that one. He didn't answer the one I've been praying for 10 years for my child. Where's he at on that prayer? God hears them. There's some things that Jesus has to say to us that are so profound that prepare us to hear his answer that are just incredible. I love that Martin Luther, he says, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. It's so true. This week I met with a guy named Matt Potter. Matt Potter. Matt 
is the inventor of Pray.com. This is me and Matt hanging out and got to spend some time with him. Pray.com is his invention. He just, he's like, Johnny, I need prayer about how to steward the number one website in the world for people trying to figure out, people who don't believe in God, people who are wanting to believe in God, but don't know how all kinds of people want to pray. And they, where do you go? You go to the internet, pray.com. I mean, just see what comes up. And Matt says, man, Johnny, I really need to steward this well. If you don't know about Pray.com, as a church, I want for you to know about it. Incredible resource. They've got a tool on there where you can kind of hit play, and it'll put, play some music, and there'll be like some, some thought-provoking music, not something that's like, you know, just kind of like pull you into a, a place of prayer, and then it'll, it'll guide you through a prayer. Like, let's praise God for who he is and let's thank him for what he's done and kind of posture your heart and over the course of 20 minutes, really take you somewhere. There's some great tools on pray.com for children and for Bible studies and for daily reminders for prayer. And so I, I want for us to be a church that's just on it. We actually, if you can go to pray.com and set up your own profile and very soon our church will even have uh, its own membership area where we can come together and kind of use this incredible tool to be praying together for specific things. And so I want you to know about that tool. There's a moment, and this is just a two-week series. We read it last week. It's a moment where the guys closest to Jesus, to some men and women that have been following him for a while. They come to him in Luke 11, 1, and they say this. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. This Lord's Prayer is called, really could probably more accurately labeled, the disciples' prayer, because they go to him and they simply say this, we're seeing you connect with the Father in a way that we desperately want. There was something about Jesus' time with the Father to where when these guys come around and they say, you're changed when you come back, there's power there. We need it. We need that. Whatever that is you have, teach us to pray. And it's not, it's not, I would say, it's the, the exact words. There, there are some people who say, okay, I want to do this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Matthew 8, 9. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's Jesus' teaching on prayer. This disciples' prayer, when they come and say, teach us to pray, it's not so, Jesus isn't like, pray it exactly this way, exactly this words, as much as he is saying, thought for thought, idea for idea, follow this pattern. There's a pattern with which we must pray. Because Jesus already knows, before you mention the deepest concerns on your heart, what it is that you're concerned about. Matthew 6, 8, before you mention it, he, he knows. There's a pattern that's set up that Jesus says, well, if you want to know, go in this order for this reason. Prayer prepares us for the proper use of the answer that God is going to give. Get that. Prayer, when we follow the pattern that Jesus says, okay, do this, then this, then this, when we follow this short pattern, God is giving us like, like an adjustment, almost like a chiropractic adjustment where he's moving bones, God, putting us into alignment so that we're ready to use the answer that God gives us. And it's super important because we're all used to kind of like vending machine prayer. You walk up, you put a dollar bill in. If it's 1985 today, you use your credit card, right? You put it and you go E3 and then whatever is in E3 comes out. You just go to God. God, I want this. E3. Please give it to me. And you wait. Now, I know what E3, I know what E3 is. Okay? You should too, if you're a Christian. Right? Some of, some of you right now, you're thinking you know. E3 is Reese cups. <laughs> if you think it's Funyuns, oh, come on. Who is already, who is getting Funyuns? That, that mach, the Funyuns in that machine are from the Carter administration. Okay? <laughs> those things, <laughs> ain't no one getting those. Right? But that's how we come to Jesus. And he's like, no, 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 no. You want to connect with the Father. You want me to teach you to pray. Go in this order. And here's how it's set up. There's this perfect weightedness in God's word. 
where we say, like in every way, like the math in God's word, the weight, the symmetry of God's word, it's perfect in every way. Here's one of the cool examples of how God's word is perfect. The law that God gives Moses in the book of Exodus, the law is perfectly weighted. The first half of the commandments are our relationship with God the Father. How we interact with the Father. The second half of the Ten Commandments given to Moses, the people of Israel, they're becoming this great nation that will one day have Jesus born into it as a Jew and save the world. That law, the law that we have to live by, the second half are all about our relationship with one another. First half, how we interact with God. Second half, how we interact with each other. So when the apostles come to Jesus and say, teach us to pray, Jesus does the same thing. There's this perfect symmetry and weightedness where he's like, nothing has changed. I'm the same today, yesterday, tomorrow, forever. The first of the commandments in our prayer life is, God, you're, you're good. God, praise you for who you are. I'm praying to a good father. God, your will be done, not my will. God, your kingdom come. Your spiritual kingdom come. May your kingdom break out where we are in this land. And there's this adjustment that happens as we go to the Father and get our hearts ready for the second part. Here's the second part. Two weeks, first part, us and God. Second part, us and one another. Our petitions. It's perfect weightedness. Here's the first one. It comes from verse 11, Matthew 6, 11. Give us today our daily bread. We've got to pray for today. Pray, pray for today. Jesus does this thing right away when he switches gears from the adjustment we get, we're getting prepared for God's answer. And we get an adjustment between us and the Father and then he comes to where we're at. This is when we come with our petitions and he says, do this, whoa, 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 whoa. Get, get, get centered on the present. Right now today, this is God's YOLO. That's what this is. Yeah, some of you are like, I don't know what that is. Okay, you probably also don't have, you know, an iPhone. But YOLO is, it's one of these things that means you only live once, right? Most of the time when someone posts that, they're doing, they're making a very bad life decision. They're probably going to die. Their friends are going to die. Someone's going to prison. It's going to be bad, right? When Jesus is saying those like the good version, like you only live this day one time. And sometimes we're praying about something that's way down the road or way out of our control. And guess, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus wants to be with us in the small and the all. But he starts right where you are. He's like, let's just get you centered on just today. Matter of fact, Jesus speaks to what you're going through right now in this moment. You ever get a word from Jesus that's like right where you are? Here's right where you are. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This order that Jesus calls us into to like get our prayer. I'm telling you what, your prayer life, you're like, I just, I don't know, man. I just, I pray to God and it's just like, I think we should pray for things. Like we, you, parents, you better be praying for the person that's going to marry your child. That's a long, you better, I'm telling you what, it's like 50 years of Christmases that'll be ruined if you like, okay. 30 Thanksgivings of awkwardness, right? I mean, you better be praying for that. But your prayer life will dramatically change if you get in, like, God, just help me get through today because he, here's who he is. He's not just a God of, like, you're happily ever after. He's a God of your, like, your problems right now. Pray for, pray for the small and the all. Pray for right now. The next thing he says is in verse 12, Matthew 6, 12, and forgive us our debt. Forgive us of our debt. See, the, the progression here is like, get centered on just today. Jesus wants to meet you. He wants to connect you to the Father right now in this very instant, right now in this moment, right now in your issue today. He is a present, fast, quick God to your, your time of need. And then he says, the next thing you pray for is your day. Imagine if we just said, hey, we've got a really good line to the Father here at church. We've been praying for stuff lately. It's just, it's all coming true. Okay, and we're on a roll. We're just, we're kind of got a hot hand here. So everyone put down your three top prayer requests. Chances are pretty good. They're all going to come through. We, you guys will be like, oh, prayer cards. Wait, we, we get more prayer cards in the back. Do we have a box? Like, just write them on a napkin, people. Some of you is like, well, I've got five, but I'll settle for three. Three definite. I'll take you up on that. Here's what Jesus does. 
He's like, I want to help you order your needs. There's an order to your needs. And if you get the order wrong, we just, we, we come running in. God, you got to help grandma. She's got this thing coming up and, you know, help me with this and help me with that. It's like, whoa, Jesus, like, I know your greatest need. And I need to make sure when you come and you want to have this connection to me, your connection is going to grow when your greatest need is at the top. Here is our greatest need. We have a debt. A debt is like baggage, something that you owe. Something that's on your back, something you can't shake, something you can't get rid of, something, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's a problem and you feel weighted down by it. You feel like it's too much for you to carry. Some of us are carrying so much debt, it's starting to, it's starting to hurt our body. It's sin. The debt that Jesus is talking about is our sin, our sin against God, our sin against one another. And your body, your frame cannot handle it. It's weighing you down even physically. And in this moment, Jesus says, I want you to recognize first your biggest need. Can I tell you how great, wait, I want to, for us when we come together to be a church that's about the gospel. We want to be a gospel-centric church. I, I hope that every single Sunday, if you bring someone, hey, we're going to invite someone to church. You know, last week, you know, Johnny played MC Hammer. He actually referenced Talladega Nights in a sermon, and it kind of made sense. I mean, we should, we got to invite someone. Anything could happen. I feel safe. You do that. Here's our promise. Our promise to, that we will, we will share the good news. It's still amazing news that a man came and lived a perfect life. He wasn't just man like us. He was also all God. That's a bold claim. That person is either a liar, crazy, or indeed the son of God. He cannot be anything else. It's one of those three. So we proclaim that Jesus lived a perfect life. That's the good news. You know what? This isn't just fire insurance. If you believe in that, if you get a friend to believe in that, if something tragically happens to them and they die a, a young death, they'll go to heaven. That's great. That's great. But Jesus shows up now, and here's what he does. He takes our debt. Freedom! The gospel is freedom right now. Jesus says, start praying for today and recognize when you come to me and pray, the first and greatest need you have is, God, take my debt away. God, I want to live free. God, take this off my back. I don't want the guilt. I don't want the shame. I just want to be alive again like I was when I was a kid and I didn't know this thing that's holding me down. And in this very moment, God offers freedom. And he says, come praying for forgiveness of your sins. And here's what happens. There's this, there's this kind of thing you trip into it. Okay, I'm, a, I'm the, admittedly, my wife's sick. She's at home today. You're going to hear her say amen from my house, all right? I'm the world's worst driver, right? You, you can hear her. She's like, amen, right? <laughs> I am, I am. And so when someone does something, I get cut off. Or I get, I'm, like, I'm like, oh, it's okay. I'm rolling my window and I'm like, it's all right. I'm worse than you. <laughs> There's a trail of people behind me that are mad. I'm never going to be like, I can't believe that person did that. I'm normally like, oh, I believe they did it. I've done way worse than that in the last 10 minutes. This is what God is saying. Like for, when you come to him and you say, God, forgive me of my debt. And he says, all right. And you get that debt taken off of you. You know what you are? You're in a place of readiness. Your heart is in a place of readiness. This is why it says in the same sentence, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Now here's a big problem. This is a massive problem. Some of us don't understand our own debt, right? We think like, ah, oh, you know, I owe God like, you know, 50 cents. I don't know, maybe maybe 75 cents. No, here's how much we owe. A debt we cannot pay. There's no hope to ever get out of the debt that we are in. Romans 3.23, Paul says, every single person alive has fallen short of the perfection that God demands. Who can be perfect? And one tiny piece of not being perfect is as bad as not being perfect in every way in your life. And so when you come to a realization that you have a massive debt that you cannot pay, and then Jesus says, gone. Free. Run out and play. Go enjoy your life. I take it. 
It's redeemed. It's restored. It's fixed. I'm going to fill in the cracks. It's not over. It's not too late. You're not broken beyond my, com- my control. Oh, man, this is why worship should be good at church, right? When we're worship, I know you worship in the car, right? I, I know, right? It's one of the reasons I'm a bad driver. Um, to get my worship on. Right? Whoa, like, got to keep your hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. We get at church and we're looking at one another and we're like, are you forgiven? Because I'm forgiven. Like, we're like elf at Christmas time, right? Do you know him? Do you know Santa? I know him. Except Jesus is not Santa. Jesus is real, right? Man, this readiness builds in us the opportunity that when we see debt in other people, debt done to us, we say, hey, he's forgiven me of so much. You're good. You're good. And Jesus says, Praying like this will change your life. Because here's the problem. If we don't do that, our prayer life is going to be hurt. You're like, whoa, 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 are you saying we have to earn forgiveness? No, we do not earn forgiveness. Forgiveness for us, it's free to us because Jesus paid it all. It's not a free gift. It cost everything. It cost his life. It cost him leaving paradise to come and put on humanity, which is less than, by the way. And so it costs a great deal. To us, it's free. We don't earn forgiveness, but here's something that does happen. Our prayer life can be hurt. Like, oh, no, you say, no, 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 that that, that doesn't happen. No matter what God, I'm just going to, can I just tell you what the word of God says? Some of you take notes. You might want to write this down and check me later. This might be new to you. Luke 639 links not loving people. If you don't love people, it links that with your prayers being hurt. Like, man, God, I want you to show up in my life. I want you to show up. Like, you wonder why you're hitting a wall because God's saying to you, look, you've got some people that you need to love. You want me to show up in your life. I desperately want to show up in your life and I want to answer a prayer for you, but you're not ready for the answer I have because of that relationship that's broken. That's what God's word says about our connection to him in prayer. Not my words, his word. James 4.3 says selfishness and pride hurt our prayers. When we're, when we're praying for things that only impact us, that only we want, that's our kingdom. Lack of faith. Hebrews 11.16 says it's impossible, impossible to please God without faith. Well, faith, I just can't wrap my arms around it. What is faith? What, such a big word. Like I, I'm going to get it tattooed on my sleeve. And I'm like, oh, it means, oh, well, what does it mean to you? Here's what it means to God. Faith in the Bible is believing that God is who he says he is. And he'll do what he says he'll do, even though you haven't seen it come to pass yet. And you just start living your life like it's going to happen. When? I don't know, but I'm not going to stop living my life after him. That is the definition of faith. It's impossible to please God without it. Our prayers will be hurt. Disobedience, John 3, 21, licks disobedience. When we know what God's word says and we just say, I don't care, I'm gonna choose sin. Heard a preacher say recently that uh, sin is fun. It is, it's a whole lot of fun. Some of you are like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna respond to that. He's setting me up, it's a setup. I know, I know a setup from this guy when I feel like going. No, it, it is, if you don't think it's fun, you're doing it wrong, Right? But here's the thing, it's only fun for a little while. It's, and, and when it's not fun, it's a whole lot of not fun. And what God says is that disobedience, that sin, it will hurt your connection to me in your prayers. Here, this one hits me like a ton of bricks. First Peter 1, 3 through 7, as a father and as a husband, the actual word used in the NIV here is there's a hindrance There's a a crippling, a hindrance on my prayers when I don't treat my wife and my children as a father the way I'm supposed to. You know, fathers, you want to connect to God and you want to pray. The way you treat your your spouse, the way you treat your children, has a direct correlation, says Peter, who walked closely with Jesus. He's inspired to write this book. He says it's going to hurt it. We can't have a right relationship with God when we're hurting everyone around us and holding their sins against them. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ God forgave you. So here's the end of it. Very short, it's a very short lesson that Jesus gives us on prayer. Here's his last piece in the pattern we need to follow. We gotta pray for protection. 
We got to pray for protection. Here's the words that Jesus says. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This, this verse trips a lot of people up. They're like, oh, God's tempting me. God tempts nobody. James, James chapter one says, God does, he's not in the business of tempting you. God is in the business sometime of allowing you to go through circumstances that make you, that force you to need him. Like, why won't you take this from me? He's like, because you need me more today than you needed me yesterday. You're welcome. You're like, well, maybe I don't want to be close to you then. This is, this is hard. And when you get an appetite for the closeness of the goodness of God, nothing but him will quench it. When you get an appetite for that, and God is not tempting you, but what God is doing is he's guiding you. And when we pray like Jesus tells us to pray here, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. What we're saying is, God, guide us through life. Don't let us get into something that's so stupid, you're going to have to come and miraculously rescue us like you talk about in Matthew chapter 4. Lead us in such a way that we are acknowledging your will and we see that you're leading. And here's the deal. I want, to sum, I want to sum this little section up for you. The important thing about prayer is not getting an answer. It's not getting that answer, but it's being the type of person that God can trust with an answer. I mean, wrap your mind around. It's the, the thing about prayer, lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is saying, I want to form you. I want to fashion you. I want to mold you into a type of person that's ready for the answers I need to give you in prayer. And some of us have been hitting a wall. No, nah, we're down now angry and mad. I mean, you might be a believer. You sing the songs. You feel like you're going to go to hell. You know that Jesus knows you. But there is a distance in your life because you're angry about some of this because he's given you some answers and you've not done the work to be ready for those answers because it's not the answer you want. God answers prayer. And many times his answer to prayer is to start to fashion us to be ready to receive what he has to say to us. This has been a... It's been a very special week. Uh, it's, it's not every week that I get the chance to go and be around a bunch of pastors. So this, this last week, uh, we were a part of a convention. Uh, me and some of the pastors here on staff went. And uh, we are a local church that's governed by autonomous elders. We've got a group of elders that all go here and attend here. I think you can see them on our website. Great group of guys. And we are not the only Christians. Okay, We are Christians only. I love that. Or, or there are other Christians out there. We're not the only ones. We're just Christians only. So sometimes I get a chance to go and be with other pastors and praise God and get in the word. And be. And so when I was out this week, I was out uh, Ben Ford. Uh, this, this is me and my father-in-law and Riley. We had three generations of preachers at this event. And this is Ben and Caitlin Ford, who were pastors here. And we've sent them to Odessa, Texas. They moved from Odessa, Florida to Odessa, Texas, and they're pastoring a church there now. We said, Ben and Caitlin, you got to come with us. We're just with a bunch of our partners that we support, some of our partners that we support missionally. We were with uh, Ryan. Ryan works for Go Ministries. I was with Ryan. We're on a patio, and there's about 50 of us guys out there. All churches that support Go. They're in the Dominican Republic. I've been recently. I'm probably going to invite some of you to go with me in the near future as soon as we can. And they say this. We're going to plant 1,000 churches in 10 years. 1,000 churches. That's, that's pretty ambitious. They've already done 350. I visited 15 of those churches on my last trip there. We support them financially every single month so they can plant churches that plant churches. It's not just in the DR. They're going to Argentina. They're in Mexico. They're in Puerto Rico. Like They're taking over Latin America. They're in the prisons. Prison systems are telling them, come in and preach the gospel because you're changing our prison. Love that we support them financially every month with another group that we support, missionaries all around the world. We've supported CMFI for over 20 years as a church. Financially, every single month, we support them and their missionaries. It's one of those things I just inherited. I've only been here four years, and I didn't know how awesome they were. Now I know, because I've gotten to know them. I got to see our friends at CMFI this week. Heard about some of the countries that they were in that we would call closed countries. Country, I can't tell you where it was because the missionaries that are there doing a work, their lives would be in danger. One of those missionaries uh, relayed to me what their practice is for growing the church. And this is, these are people we support monthly. 
excited to be a part of their ministry, and I was just blown away at their report. They go, they go door to door, just knock on the door. Hello, we want to tell you about Jesus. He's, uh, he's got this book that's written about him. It's the oldest book in the world, most documented book in the world, miraculously stored written in your language today, and it testifies that Jesus was a real person, the Son of God, lived a perfect life, and he's alive right now, and he'll take your debt away. They classify that moment into three categories. There's the green, where people are like, oh, let's talk about it. That sounds great. Never heard about Jesus. Come on in. That's green. Let's go. Uh, yellow is like, uh, push away. I don't think so. I, don't know. I hear my mom calling. Got to go. Red is they just slam the door in your face. Three, yellow, green, red, you get it. You get the categories. He said this to me. He said, we pray for all three groups, but we zero in with a whole lot of prayer on one of those groups. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, well, yeah, you know, the green group, you really get on them, right? They're receptive. No, red. The people that just slam the door in our face, the people that they're, they're farthest from God, we pray for them the most. Because when they come to a life-changing knowledge of Jesus Christ, when the Spirit of God comes into their life and they say, he's real, everyone around them is like, you believe? What? They pray for those people the most. The most. Yellow people, the people that are in the yellow group and the, the green group, they're probably going to get there. They zero in on those who are farthest from God. Paul was the far. Paul the Apostle Paul was on his way to kill Christians and God jumped up and said, we're going to do the opposite. You're going, to, you're going to grow the church like it's never been grown. It's not going to be just for the Jewish people. It's going to be for everyone that's here today. Everyone, anyone. God's heart is for those who are the farthest away. His heart is for you. And prayer was the thing that opened up those doors of people that were like, get out of here, man. Those people... When they come to a knowledge in Jesus Christ, I said, well, what happens then? I mean, this, this is a country that's been on the news. You would, you would be blown away. And he said, well, immediately if they get saved, they are now the pastor of their town. I'm like, whoo, well, that's fast. <laughs> They're like, where's my transform book? I guess I'm leaving a small group. I know what's going on. Like, Sign them up right there, right? I told this guy in the lobby, right, just right before we all met here. He got baptized on Thursday and I said, Welcome home. You, you can run just as fast as a brand new believer as someone, some of these people that have been around here for 20 years. Some of these people that have grown up in the church. You can run just as fast. Matter of fact, sometimes you run faster because you know that your debt was big and now it's gone. And you're like, I'm debt free. I'm king of the world, right? And prayer is the thing that makes people go from, I don't care what you have to say to, Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. And I, I continue to ask the question, is your appetite, is your appetite for the forever, has it diminished? And has something come into your life where you're afraid to connect with Jesus? You're afraid to cry out to God the Father. You've got to pray just to make it today. Super important. I want to end our service by doing something that I've not done in the time that I've, I've been the senior pastor at this church. Uh, we read God's word as a church, but never before have I gone to the book of Romans chapter 8 and said, hey, we're just going to close with what Paul would have to say. I mean, in the first century church, you know, they, they, they didn't have, you know, like a video wall and pictures. And they, they were just like, well, we got a letter from Paul, everybody. We're going to read it. Billy, you read good. Come up here. All right? Give it your best, Billy. And they just read what the Holy Spirit told Paul to say to the church. Here's what I believe. That the power of God's word, it's just enough. It's all we need. And Paul writes in Romans chapter eight, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemning you. Zero condemning you. You can't be condemned of your debt anymore because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness 
of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's paid in full. You've met the requirement. Perfect righteousness. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not submit to God's law. It cannot do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Time out. You feel something in you right now? Say, I don't want to be there. I don't want to live like that. Confess that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Believe in faith that he is indeed the Son of God. Be obedient to water baptism. And Paul will say this about you. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you're in the realm of the Spirit. It's a good place to be. It's a good realm. Here's why. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, that's where you are. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Come on. Hey, the Word of God's enough, man. They're like, Billy, keep reading. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we've got an obligation. But it's not to the flesh. We've got an obligation to live according to it. For if you will live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Is there someone here today who's ready to put to death the misdeeds of your own body and the flesh and get to a new spirit realm? Come on. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about by your adoption to sonship. By Him you cry, Abba, Father. Direct connection. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. In the, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Anyone sharing in some sufferings today, you got the hope to share in glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Can't even compare that which is to come, he says. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There is gonna be a new heaven that will come down upon a new earth and the children of God will dwell in it. He is gonna make all that has fallen in Genesis 3 brand new again. And we don't have to just wait for that day because freedom can happen right now. He says this, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. You get new bodies. Some of you are like, sign me up. I need it right now. You gotta wait. Right now your body's dying. You're dying. But your soul is gonna live forever if you're in the spirit realm. And then you're gonna get a new body that's gonna live forever and a new heaven and a new earth. This is what's being talked about. 
For in this hope, we were saved. But the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Are you in a spirit realm? You have it. Is Jesus Christ alive in you? You own it. Forever is yours. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He's going to take it straight there. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that all things, all in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Come on, church. Anyone ready to praise? Anyone ready to celebrate? Anyone ready to stand on up? Come on. Paul says this at the end. What then shall we say in response to these things? What is our response to living in the spirit realm? What is our response to a direct connection to the Father? What is our response that our debt has been paid, that we can forgive people that have sinned against us? Here's what Paul says. Paul says, here's a good response. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one that condemns? Who? No one. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised from life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us right now. That's our reality. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or political agenda or global warming or cheese fans? Nobody! Nothing! No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I am sure, I am ready to testify, I am ready to confess, I'm ready to live my life as if neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything in all our creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Great are you, Lord.